So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered to date. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community. 
and many Mayan experts work to debunk Williams' findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to Williams' methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of Williams' findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siwol, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu Underground City was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. 
There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact! Fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. 
The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot-tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the Temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the 2nd century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heracleion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, Many ships heading for Heracleion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heracleion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings which are now the best-known structures in the park. Ever since Plato wrote about the allegory of Atlantis, humanity has been fascinated with the possibility of the discovery of a thriving underwater civilization. Fancy joining me on a trip to a few historic underwater sites? Let's see what we can find out about ancient civilizations. The first one on our list is what is being called the underwater Stonehenge. Scientists have recently discovered a mysterious pile of cairns that stretch for miles under the shimmering waters of Lake Constance at the borders of Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Archaeologists began to explore the site back in 2015, and they haven't been able to understand yet what it was actually used for. What they do know is that there is a 12-mile line of 170 human-made stone cairns under Lake Constance. Scientists say this was most likely the result of a combined work of several villages. The cairn site was probably used for some collective purpose. The formations are huge, 
Some of them are several dozen feet wide. The most amazing discovery so far is that the site dates back to around 5,500 years ago. Now, what were we humans doing back then? We were living in the prime years of the so-called Stone Age. We were beginning to make artifacts from stone and use them to hunt and eat. Can you imagine what a knife and fork might have looked like back in those days? It's no coincidence that scientists call this site the underwater Stonehenge though. Both sites are believed to have been built around the same period of time. You see, Stonehenge dates back to around 3100 BCE. Both sites carry the distinct characteristic of stone monuments built in a circle. Not to mention the fact that scientists also haven't figured out why on earth our early ancestors would feel the need to build a monument such as Stonehenge. Well, the mystery of Lake Constance hasn't been solved yet. Who were the Neolithic people from this area? And for what purpose did they go through such an amount of work and effort to build this huge stone site? Next, we're taking you on a tour of the Ryukyu Islands just off the coast of Japan. You're diving deep down to an archaeological site. But I should warn you, the waters of the Pacific Ocean are far from smooth. It doesn't take long before you see a huge structure thanks to the sunlight shining down on the seabed. At first, it looks like Machu Picchu's ruins located across the globe in Peru. As you approach the site, you slowly figure out its forms. A pyramid-shaped structure, arches, staircases. It's something that could have easily been a palace or a castle. Could this be a sign of human activity? What you've just seen is known today as the Yonaguni Monument. It also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five soccer fields and the height of a five-story building. Its most surprising feature is its expanse of terraces. Explorers and scientists believe that Yonaguni might be 10,000 years old. But whether it's a human-made structure or a natural formation is still under debate. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura, Yonaguni is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kimura has dived to the bottom of the ocean to explore the ruins over 100 times over the past 10 years. According to him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. On the monument's surface, there is a triangle-shaped concave that is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. There is also a giant turtle carved on the eastern side of the structure. And, according to Kimura, turtles have an important cultural meaning. Several pieces of stone tools have been recovered from the site. Their estimated age is around 10,000 years. However, not all scientists support this theory. For many, Yonaguni is the result of thousands of years of erosion. The fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it's not human-made. The defined edges and flat surfaces resemble a natural formation in Northern Ireland, known as the Giant's Causeway. The basalt columns look like the ruins of a palace, but they're actually the result of volcanic activity in the region. Now, you're flying to the coast of Greece, four hours away from Athens. More specifically, you're in the Peloponnese Peninsula. You dust off an old snorkel and head for a free dive on a bright sunny day. Sometime into the dive, you start noticing patterns on a seabed. 13 feet below the surface, outlines of familiar objects start to appear one by one. As you continue swimming, what looks like the outline of an entire city emerges in front of your eyes. Are you wondering how water could have taken the whole city? Rocks are perfectly aligned into what appears to be the foundation of a building. This is Pavlopetri, an ancient city you've probably heard about for the first time. It was discovered by Nicholas Fleming, a British oceanographer, when he was on vacation in Greece. He had heard rumors about Pavlopetri's existence and, indeed, found several artifacts on the seafloor. He went back to the area a year later with the team, 
they found a site filled with pots, storage vessels, and tools. A kern stone, for instance, is a tool used for grinding grains and turning them into flour. Multiple amphoras indicate that this settlement dates back to the Bronze Age, 5,500 years ago, when people started living in towns. The settlement is believed to have existed for over 2,400 years. Today, Pavlopetri is considered the oldest submerged town ever discovered. And what's impressive is that it wasn't a simple village. It was a vibrant port city with stone buildings, a marketplace, streets, and even squares. The next stop on our voyage is one of today's most famous underwater cities that has been turned into an archaeological park. The city of Port Royal in Jamaica exists only below the surface, but in 1692, it was one of the wealthiest cities in the Western Hemisphere. Port Royal was the center of the British Empire at the time and an important trade city that attracted people from all over the region. It was also home to real-life pirates of the Caribbean. On the morning of June 7, 1692, the people of Port Royal met a different fate than they had probably expected. The city woke up shaking. People were thrown out of their beds by the power of a massive earthquake, ranking 7.5 on a Richter scale. One survivor said he had seen Earth opening up and swallowing the whole town. What he said could be true, as the city was mainly built on sand. The ground swallowed buildings, roads, you name it. Geysers erupted and finally, waves as big as 10-story buildings hit the city. About 33 acres of the city disappeared under the water. Amazingly, most of its 17th century remains are still in good condition under 40 feet of water. Archaeologists have found taverns, storage rooms, kitchens, and recreational buildings used for diverse purposes. You can also see a grand lion statue, a submerged bridge, and many picturesque arches. Of course, I save the best for last, India. Just off its coast lies another sunken marvel. A site known as the Lost City of Cambay is located in the Gulf with a similar name. It remained undiscovered until 2001, when the National Institute of Ocean Technology made a routine water assessment. With the help of sonar technology, which sends a wave sound to the bottom of the sea, they found something far beneath the surface. Images showed well-defined geometric shapes spread along a five-mile stretch. The remains date to more than 9,500 years ago, meaning this civilization was lost at around the end of the Ice Age. Debris recovered from the site included construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even bones. Scientists argue whether these artifacts are indeed from the site, but if they truly are, then the lost city of Cambay might be the oldest civilization in the world. Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth. But you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican's secret archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, 
but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home, and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encouraged tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public. Like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads. But the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. 
some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam, but you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. They used to call this island the Paris of the East, mostly because it had beautiful buildings with large gardens and impressive stone archways. But now, it's nothing like it used to be with all the architecture almost entirely covered in tree roots and vines. Ross Island is a small territory in the Indian Ocean. It's located east of the Indian city of Port Blair. Though initially thought of as a jail, Ross Island eventually became a luxurious resort for the local administrators. They called this island a real treat for its more privileged residents. It boasted opulent bungalows, stained glass window panels brought all the way from Italy, neatly kept gardens, tennis courts, and even swimming pools. Soon after the complex was closed in 1937, a powerful earthquake hit the island. It caused a lot of damage, making it even more uninhabitable. The island is now in the administration of India and has become a tourist attraction for people interested in abandoned towns. Pieces of German architecture still lie hidden in the Namibian desert. The city of Kolmanskop, Namibia, was a luxury location at its peak in the early 1900s when German workers settled here looking for diamonds. This abandoned town used to have everything from a ballroom to a hospital and even a bowling alley. It all started to decline somewhere in the late 1910s when another diamond-packed location was found nearby. So. Most of the people living here moved, leaving everything behind in search of more money. Kolmanskop has since been slowly occupied by sand dunes, while the hot temperature and low moisture helped to preserve the buildings. This ghost town is also available for visitors. If it sounds interesting, you can book a tour in the nearby town of Luderitz. Another abandoned castle dominates the view in Krakow, a city in Italy. The whole village sits atop a cliff that's 1,312 feet high. The founders liked this location since they knew it would be easy to defend themselves from unwanted guests. But the castle, built in the 1300s, soon became overwhelmed by landslides and earthquakes. Even though it has no residents anymore, the medieval city often comes alive during the various local festivals that take place here in the summer months. The locals also offer tours and tell amazing stories about the location. One of the highlights of the tour is a statue that seemingly came out of nowhere and now lies in a body of water. Hidden away in the Montana mountains, Garnet Ghost Town tells the well-known American story of the West's Gold Rush. The town's history goes back to the 1890s when they found a lot of gold in the Nancy Hanks mine. During its glory days, Garnet had almost 1,000 residents. Even though it's in a relatively secluded location, it had saloons, hotels, stores, a school, and other features of a regular little town. In 1905, when most of the gold had already been taken away, most mines were left behind, so only a couple of hundred residents stayed in Garnet. The final straw came in 1912, when a fire damaged most of the town's buildings. So, by the 1940s, Garnet was completely abandoned. It soon became a hotspot for treasure hunters looking for furnishings and artifacts. That was until a preservation campaign started in the 1970s. It ended with the town being declared a historic district in 2010. To this day, Garnet is one of the best preserved ghost towns in the area. Hashima Island is another abandoned location that tells us that when people leave, nature takes over. This mysterious place was even featured in a James Bond movie because of its ghostly landscape. It used to be a well-known spot in Japan for undersea coal mines, 
as it was opened in 1881. In 1959, at its peak, there were over 5,000 people living here, including mine workers and their families. As soon as the mines started going dry, sometime in 1970, people started to slowly depart the island, leaving it completely abandoned in three months. Even though nobody lives there these days, there are a lot of tourists here that drop off to wander around the abandoned homes, swimming pools, stores, and factories. Another town that started with a mining company back in 1881 is Calico, California. People discovered the location was packed with silver, so it soon became home to over 500 silver mines and 3,000 residents. It used to feature hotels, general stores, restaurants, and a school. There was even a local newspaper printed here called the Calico Print. But by 1986, the town had become empty. One of the former locals decided to buy it and began its restoration, making it a registered historical landmark. It even has a museum of the Old West available for tourists. One of the most interesting attractions that were rebuilt is the one mile long Calico and Odessa Railroad. It currently goes through the steep canyons and hills and even passes the old mines and buildings north of Calico. Approximately one third of the town is original, while the rest consists of newer buildings that are replicas meant to recreate the spirit of its past. If you're a fan of cars, you might have heard of Henry Ford as the famous American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. But in 1927, he began working on another one of his ambitious dreams, Fordlandia. It was supposed to be a massive rubber plantation located near the Tapajos River in Brazil, since he needed a reliable source of rubber for his car tires and hoses. His vision was to design a town complete with swimming pools, a golf course, living bungalows, and even weekly square dancing sessions for the locals. This project was unfortunate to begin with, since the local rubber trees soon got infected with leaf fungus. Even though Henry Ford invested a staggering $20 million into this potential income source, the town failed to produce the needed rubber. He had nothing left to do but to sell it to Brazil in 1945. And soon, it was completely abandoned. Many of its buildings are still standing, but have been taken over by the surrounding nature. You can still see curious tourists wandering through it to this day. During its glory days, Hampi was the second largest city in the world. Looking at its ruins today, it's hard to imagine this Indian city used to be filled with temples and bazaars and that it served as an important center of the Mauryan Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries. It was destroyed in the 16th century, but it still has beautifully preserved forts and markets. It became part of the UNESCO World Heritage in 1986, aiming to protect its buildings, such as the Lotus Mahal, a stone structure that was carved to resemble a lotus flower opening to the sun. A tourist village was constructed back in 1920 along the shore of Epicuan, a salt lake about 370 miles southwest of Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was designed to provide people with a busy city life a breath of fresh air near the restorative salt waters of the nearby lake. It was soon equipped with a railroad station and ended up having a population of more than 5,000 residents. The project was also destined to fail soon enough as the unusual amount of rain at that time caused Lake Epicuan to swell. In 1985, the water took over the local dam and the town was flooded. The waters were so deep that they even reached a depth of 33 feet in 1993. They only began to recede in 2009 and left behind the remaining buildings, literally encrusted in salt. No one came back to the town except for Pablo Novak, who returned here back in 2012 and was the only resident of Villa Epicuan at the time. It's raining cats and dogs, literally. Things falling down from the sky can be pretty unexpected. So here are some examples. Residents of Texarkana, Texas once had light rain and fish shower. No need to go fishing out in the sea. The fish literally falls down on your head. In fact, animal rains are not uncommon. Water spouts or updrafts occurring in different corners of the earth sometimes carry small creatures up with them. Those could be crabs, frogs, or indeed, fish. 
A water spout is generally a whirlwind that picks up water and grows in size until it connects the surface of the water and the clouds. Lightweight critters living close to the water surface often get caught in the vortex and carried up and away. Thunderstorm clouds are constant companions of water spouts too. When the storm reaches a landmass, it starts slowing down, having nowhere to take the new energy from. It slowly subsides, the atmospheric pressure drops, and the thunderclouds release the water in them, along with the unfortunate small animals and fish. Sometimes it's just a few frogs frozen from the cold up above, but at other times it could be hundreds or thousands of creatures raining down upon the land. A much more unusual rain once happened in Oakville, Washington, and it's still waiting for someone to explain it. The rain clouds looked perfectly normal, but the rain they released was anything but. Translucent jelly-like blobs fell on the town, covering a total area of about 20 square miles. Each of them wasn't larger than a grain of rice. Researchers who studied these raindrops claimed that the gooey blobs contained human white blood cells. Some believe they might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or waste from a commercial airplane. Now this kind of rain is what I'd like to see someday, a money shower. One such event occurred in a small town in Germany. A woman was driving when she suddenly saw banknotes swirling down from the sky, so she hit the brakes. She went out of her car and later said she managed to collect quite a large amount of money. After which, as any responsible citizen should, she turned it over to the police. Strangely, when the officers came back to the scene with the woman, they couldn't find any more cash although she claimed she hadn't been able to collect everything. There's still no explanation for the event, but certainly no water spout could have caused that. A pretty unpleasant kind of rain happened back in 1876 in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. It was a very local kind too. Mrs. Crouch said that she had been making soap outside her home when pieces of raw meat suddenly started falling down from the sky around her. Some of those chunks were pretty massive, reaching over three inches in diameter. Local newspapers reported that two people who decided to remain unknown tasted the meat and concluded it was mutton or venison. Months later, scientists decided to find out the truth behind the strange event. It became a matter of heated debate until one of the researchers came up with the most reasonable conclusion. The meat rain must have been caused by vultures flying over the town at the time. These birds sometimes regurgitate food right in the middle of their flight as a defense mechanism or to make their bodies lighter to fly faster. And that must have been what happened right over Mrs. Crouch's house, unfortunately. Something totally inedible, but no less sinister, rained down on several villages in India in the middle of May of 2022. Huge black and silver metal balls started dropping from the sky, the first one weighing over 15 pounds. Astounded residents watched in shock as it hammered the ground, scattering pieces of itself across the nearby fields. Similar balls later fell in the other two neighboring villages. Luckily, no one was harmed during the strange metal rain, but the issue remained. We're on Earth, and it usually rains water here. The local authorities weren't sure what it was about, but astronomers soon voiced a theory that it could be debris from a space rocket. One that fits the description had launched in September of 2021, aiming to put a communication satellite into orbit. Upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, it might have been damaged, causing several chunks of it to detach and fall down on the ground in India. Sometimes it rains birds, too. One such event occurred in Arkansas in 2010. Weather conditions might cause things like that to happen, but there are simpler reasons, too loud noise and confusion, or even collisions with aircraft. In the case of Arkansas, it was the noise and flashing lights from the New Year's Eve fireworks. The show startled thousands of birds and made them start into the air. They were panicking and disoriented, so they collided with buildings, cars, and trees. Many of them eventually fell to the ground, making lots of people believe it was actually raining birds. Now, if anything could startle me out in the sky, it's a rain of spiders. And if you wonder whether it's a real thing, well, yes, it is. In Australia, spider rains actually happen quite often. They even have a name for this, ballooning. 
it goes like this. Spiders that can balloon climb up trees and tall bushes, trying to reach the highest point available in the area. When they've climbed up to the very top, they spin their web in such a way that it allows them to be carried by the wind. And there it goes, clutching the strands of the web with its tiny little feet. The brave spider lifts off into the air and flies to whatever awaits it out there. Normally, ballooning goes unnoticed by us humans because spiders don't travel in large groups. You might have a shocking experience when a spider suddenly lands on your face out of nowhere, but otherwise, it's a rare occasion to meet more than two ballooners at once. Still, when the weather gets particularly bad, with lots of rain or wind, thousands or even millions of spiders might decide it's time to move to somewhere friendlier and take to the sky all at once. That's when spider rains occur. Those who witnessed the most recent ones back in 2012 and 2015 say it looks like a snowfall. Spiders slowly drifting down on their web parachutes that settle on the ground and turn it white. Remember water spouts? Well, those things can lift not only fish and frogs into the sky and make a spectacular show of them falling back on the ground. Golf balls sometimes become their cargo too. And I'm not speaking of golf ball sized hail, but actual balls. The town of Punta Gorda in Florida witnessed a rain of golf balls in 1969. Newspapers reported dozens upon dozens of those things pummeling the ground and buildings for a short while. Since it's a coastal town with lots of golf courses, it wasn't hard to explain the event. A water spout must have formed near the shore, traveled to some course, grabbed a few dozen golf balls, and then released them over the town. Rain can be pretty refreshing, as long as it's not mud rain. On April 12, 1902, the town of Easton, Philadelphia experienced an unusual shower. It made all those unfortunate enough to go outside take an actual shower and wash their clothes to boot. The raindrops looked dirty to the eye, and they were. People, buildings, and streets looked really wanting to take a good bath after it stopped pouring. The witnesses reported a considerable amount of dust in the air before the rain started, which probably explains the event. In 2011, a town in Scotland saw another weird rain variety. It was showered with worms. The rain didn't cover a large area. It seems only some local academy students were unlucky enough to get invertebrates falling on their heads while playing soccer. There was a significant change in the weather at the time, so scientists believe it might have resulted from some meteorological anomaly. It was April 10, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England, aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. 
the Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture. But deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the Moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tula, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, Someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, 
it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875 using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen Mariana of Austria. A strange lake appeared in India 52,000 years ago. It was formed here literally out of nowhere. I recall it was a Wednesday. Anyway, for tens of thousands of years, people came up with various scary stories about the lake. Some locals believe this place was cursed. Others think that the lake's bottom hides the gateway to the underworld. But those are all legends. The real reason for the appearance of this Lonar Lake is even more surprising. At first, scientists were sure that the lake was an ancient crater of a long-extinct volcano. It's in a balsam field made of 65-million-year-old volcanic rock. But then, geologists conducted a detailed analysis of the soil and water, and found that Lonar Lake had a space origin. Geologists found a unique glass inside the lake that forms only with a strong impact and energy release. 52,000 years ago, a huge meteorite weighing 2 million tons fell into this place. It was almost six times heavier than the Empire State Building. The striking power was so high that the volcanic rock melted and turned into glass. Perhaps the bottom of this lake still contains particles of this giant meteorite that flew to us from the distant space depths. Okay, we have a lake created by a space object more than 50,000 years ago. But even this is not the strangest thing about it. In 2020, the locals noticed that Lonar Lake had turned pink. In just a few days, the salt water mysteriously changed its color. Biologists and geologists immediately took water samples to the Scientific Research Center. The detailed analysis showed that the water contained an increased level of unique microbes. They accumulate on the surface and emit some pink pigment. Soon, these microbes settled to the bottom, and the lake became transparent again. Also, rains help the water go back to its usual appearance. These microbes color the lake and make the pink plumage of flamingos even brighter. The birds get food from the Lonar Lake and absorb these pink bacteria. Now, Lonar Lake is a popular place among tourists. But this is not the only thing that may surprise you in India. Our next stop is a small village with about 2,600 people located in a hot rainforest. The locals are very hospitable. They welcome not only tourists, but also one of the most venomous reptiles on the planet. King cobras are crawling in almost every house in this village. Locals are happy to see them as if they were their pets. People share water and food with these animals. They even give the reptiles a special corner where they can relax from the scorching sun. Ah, Cobras crawl in houses, schools, and even on the streets. Humans and reptiles are used to each other and feel safe. There has never been a case of a cobra attack in the village. It's the only place in the world where these venomous reptiles live in such harmony with people. Now, imagine a town that consists of many little united villages. The residents are all engaged in agriculture. They know how to extract water from ground rocks, and they bargain well. The town has been thriving for several centuries, and people live happily in it. Then, one day, everything changes. All the residents quickly pack up their stuff and run away from their homes. Overnight, the town becomes abandoned. It is a real story that happened in the state of Rajasthan in 1825. And still, no one knows why the people disappeared from there. 
The most popular version says that the cruel local ruler collected large taxes from the locals. Then he fell in love with the daughter of the chief of this town and threatened that he would collect extra taxes if the girl refused to be his wife. Citizens decided to support the woman and her father and left their homes in one day. This town is still empty, but the locals from the nearest cities are afraid to approach. Our next stop is the state of Maharashtra. There's a small village there with very positive people. They go to stores, cafes, schools, and banks. Everything here seems quite ordinary, and you wouldn't notice what's so special about this place. But just wait for the night to come. People go to sleep and no one locks their houses. There are no locks at all in this village. The door of any building is always open here. The owners leave the shops, cafes, and libraries open. When locals go to work, they don't lock up their homes either. They don't hide money and jewelry. The reason for this is the complete absence of thefts. The villagers are sure that anyone can get into serious trouble for stealing. According to a legend, about 300 years ago, after prolonged rains and floods, a large black stone slab appeared in the center of the village. This slab symbolized an Indian mythical creature that watched over the locals. At some point, people stopped locking their houses because they knew that no one would dare to commit theft in that creature's face. In 2015, a police station was opened here, but almost no one has reported an incident since then. The building doesn't even have doors because the police don't keep anyone there. Another fantastic place in India is a village in the state of Assam. Hundreds of locals prepare here for an unusual celebration every now and then. They arrange a magnificent wedding ceremony. They set the table, dress up in beautiful costumes, and bring gifts. And all this for the newlyweds. But instead of people, frogs get married here. Locals hold weddings for wild frogs to summon rain. The incredible thing is that the ceremony looks just like a real wedding. The fun can last all day until late at night. Now, there's one dangerous and inaccessible island in India. You can find it in the Bay of Bengal. It's called the North Sentinel. It's a small piece of land that looks like a tropical paradise. But you won't be able to get there. Since 1956, nobody can travel to this place. The Coast Guard is always sailing around and patrolling the area. The reason for this is the local Sentinelese tribe. This tribe lives isolated from the whole world. They don't know about modern technologies, the internet, or television. For centuries, the Sentinelese have lived on their own, away from civilization. And the people from India want to keep it that way. Anyone who approaches their island is welcomed by the tribe with a flurry of spears and arrows. And it doesn't matter if you're coming by boat or helicopter. Another reason why you can't get on the island is the Sentinelese immune system. The Coast Guard is trying to protect the local tribe from possible diseases and infections that outsiders can bring with them. The locals have no immunity from the flu or even a simple cold. They don't know what that is. Also, there are coral reefs and limestone around the island which significantly complicates the passage of large ships. Despite all the prohibitions, many people tried to get to the island. In 1880, one officer accidentally discovered this island. He went ashore and found a noble soil ideal for growing coconut palms. The officer also noticed several huts on the island, but didn't dare meet the locals. Explorers and travelers presented the islanders with fish as a gift many times. The locals accepted it, asked for more, but still didn't let them approach their houses. It was also challenging to make friends with the tribe because they communicate in one of the most difficult languages to learn in the world. Scientists and linguists have been studying this language for decades. At the end of the 20th century, outsiders made some progress in building a connection with the tribe. In 1991, a team of anthropologists invited the islanders aboard a large ship. They gave bags of coconuts to tribe members. This may be where the phrase, left holding the bag, came from. Or not. Otherwise, let's just leave these folks alone, shall we? You're strapped in a boat cruising down the Amazon River with the sun scorching hot. As you check out your map, your boat starts rocking back and forth. The water is starting to get more intense, so you hang on for dear life. You tuck your map in your pocket and try to take control of your boat. 
You strike some jagged rocks and duck low to avoid tree branches. Your boat strikes a large rock out of nowhere and capsizes. You're swimming in the murky green water. While you're trying your best to get ashore, your boat gets washed away. Underneath the water lies a whole new world of bizarre and dangerous animals. Kandiru fish are snake-like creatures that can grow up to 16 inches long. Arapimus can weigh more than an adult male and are taller than most basketball players. They're the biggest freshwater fish in South America. They have a hybrid gill system that forces them to pop up to the surface every 5 to 15 minutes to breathe in oxygen for their large swim bladder. You swim out of the raging water and dry yourself off. Oh no, your map is completely soaked. There's no way you can get to your destination without it. You venture into the thick rainforest, shoving the branches and leaves away. As you get deeper, you notice something on a tree. It's barely moving, but it's got sharp claws and a raggedy coat. It stretches its arm to another branch and tries to pull itself up. Ever so slowly. Sloths sleep more than half their days and only head down from trees once a week. They're so motionless, they sometimes grow algae and moss on their fur. The rainforest gets denser with each step until there's barely any sunlight illuminating the path in front of you. You notice a figure following you. With every branch you step on, you can hear a faint sound right next to you creeping around. You start walking a bit faster and the sound catches up with you. You make it out of the dense part and tread along a narrow path until you reach a cliff. You can't walk normally here, so you pin against the wall and walk sideways to cross the hills. You slowly move across with the river 30 feet below you. You move your right foot and some rocks fall into the river. You keep going and misstep. You're about to fall, but you hold on to a large tree branch and pull yourself up. You notice a couple of colorful poison frogs inches away from your fingers. Touching any of these frogs can be extremely dangerous and harmful, despite their amazing color patterns. The golden poison frog is one of the most poisonous animals in the world. One of them hops right next to you, so you let go of the branch and fall back in the river. The river is washing you down until you reach a calm current. Underneath you is a swarm of piranhas swimming with their sharp teeth. The red color on their skin is unmistakable, so you swim off like an Olympic athlete. Piranhas will eat anything that gets in their way, no matter the size. You grip onto a log and climb up a small rock to catch your breath. There's a huge electric eel underneath the rock. Despite their name, they're more related to catfish than eels. They use their powerful 600 volts of electricity to defend themselves and catch food. You're stuck, unless you're like the common basilisk that can run on the water like a jet ski. These incredible lizards have special webbing on their toes and can run the distance of a basketball court. You hop on a bunch of rocks until you reach the land. You continue walking along the riverbank until you come across a moving rock. You rub your eyes and see it moving again. It's a dinosaur-looking turtle that resembles a crocodile with armor. The Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle that disguises itself with its surroundings to catch prey. Their heads stretch longer than their bodies. You shimmy your way past it and continue. You head back into the rainforest and find a spot to rest. Wait, there are giant ants everywhere! They're the biggest ants in the world and can produce one of the most painful stings out there, even comparable to a wasp's sting. You immediately get up and find another place to rest. As you continue walking along, you notice the same feeling of something following you. You can hear some leaves rustling, but it's getting dark and there's no way of telling. You find a nice little spot to build a campfire and catch some Zs, but in the Amazon, everything is a threat except for those cute capybaras wandering around. They live in groups next to water sources. They're also the biggest rodents in the world. You don't need to worry about them if you're stuck in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Suddenly, you feel something slithering up next to you. You look down and see a massive green anaconda just about to constrict you. They are the heaviest snakes in the world and can grow up to 20 feet long and have a huge appetite. You get up and sprint your way out of there. All right, you found a decent cave to crash in. It's daytime again, and you're still alive. 
you continue walking along the rainforest. You were able to find some breakfast to boost your energy for the rest of the day. You spot something on a tree that looks like a branch, but it's actually a potu, a master of disguise that can spend days motionless on broken tree branches. These bizarre birds use those branches as their permanent home, where they lay their eggs and chill all day. You continue your way through the rainforest and see a Brazilian wandering spider crawling on a tree branch right in front of you. Eight of these species can be found in the Amazon area. They are some of the most aggressive and venomous spiders out there. So you make a big detour and walk away from it. You feel someone walking next to you again, but you still can't figure out what it is. You see a steep cliff with a waterfall hitting a large lake ahead of you. Looks peaceful until you see a team of black caimans gathering around the shore. They're the biggest predators in the whole Amazon ecosystem and feed on anything that moves. It's a good thing you're on high ground. Otherwise, whoa, you slip and fall down the river right on the deep end. So far, no caiman spotted you. You swim underwater and try to get to the opposite end of where the reptiles are. As you climb out and dry yourself off, you notice some large black spots on you. You try pulling them off, but they've latched on pretty hard. The Amazon giant leech finds its target by tracking movement and shadow. Once they attach themselves to the skin, it's extremely difficult to extract them. The best way to do so is to slide your finger next to its mouth and pull it off slowly. Ugh. You manage to get them off your body and see that the caimans are swimming towards you. You're pinned to the wall with the lake of hungry reptiles approaching. Suddenly, a pink dolphin jumps out of the water and splashes all over them. They can grow larger than humans and are the celebrities of the Amazon. Scientists think they get their color from the blood capillaries on their skin. The Amazon even has bull sharks swimming around. These carnivorous giant fish are threatening to humans and can swim in both salt water and fresh water. These sharks prey on anything within their reach, including other sharks. The dolphin distracted the caimans, so you climb up the cliff and try to find the best way to escape. Opened jaws waiting for you to fall into the pit are right below you. You're lucky enough to escape to the top, but as your arms pull you up, the first thing that you see is a jaguar looking straight at you. It's the creature that's been following you this whole time. You get up while it starts circling you, timing its strike. You know that you can't take on a jaguar, nor can you outrun it. So you grab a large tree branch from the ground to defend yourself. It jumps at you, but you duck down in time. The jaguar lands in the water far away from the caiman crocs. It's a good thing these large kitties are excellent swimmers. You pick yourself up and continue. And to your surprise, you find your boat again. You fix it up and sail your way out of the Amazon. Whew. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number six. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> a lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean, 
and it's salty, like a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup. You'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy 
that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water, and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. The Amazon River travels through nine South American countries at a length of over 4,000 miles. Still, it's impossible to cross it by a bridge. With the river being the main highway, traveling through this dense forest and so few areas populated around the river, there's just no reason to have one. The river can rise up to 30 feet, and the river crossings that were only 3 miles wide can expand to over 30 miles in just a few short weeks in certain spots, making a bridge nearly impossible to build here. In New Zealand, in the coastal town of Mauraki, there are huge spherical boulders. Some rocks are 6.5 feet tall and weigh about 7 tons, as much as 10 cows. Ooh, there's a 10-cow boulder! Maori legend has it that these rocks are from the remains of the goods from a large shipwreck that happened hundreds of years ago. From a more scientific perspective, it's sand and gravel combined to form these giant boulders. Waves and winds give them a smooth, round appearance over time. The whole process might take millions of years. Indonesia's Kaiwan Ijen volcano is famous for a stunning turquoise-colored lake sitting at the top of the peak, but don't dip in. It's an acid lake. But its scariest part is the sulfuric gases leaking out when lava flows freely, reaching temperatures hotter than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When those gases come in contact with the air, they combust into a spectacular electric blue flame. That's why the volcano has blue lava. The island of Surtsey, south of Iceland, was formed over 50 years ago by a volcanic eruption. It all began back in 1963, when a powerful volcanic eruption created one of the youngest islands on the planet. All sorts of bacteria, fungi, and molds began taking over the island, leading to numerous other animals finding their way here, like seals and birds. Birds and ocean waves deposited seeds all over the island. Sadly, the island's getting smaller now because of water and wind erosion. Located off the coast of Brazil, there's an island called… Eh, I'm a bit rusty on my Portuguese, so here it is on the screen. It looks perfectly untouched and pristine. Bad news? Dangerous snakes overrun it completely, so take a doctor with you in case you want to go there. Over 4,000 of the golden lancehead vipers inhabit this island. 
These three-foot-long snakes are among the most venomous in the entire world. Yeah, I think I'll skip that. Landing down under, you can see the Opera House, Uluru, lots of kangaroos, and catch the strangest wave of the world, Wave Rock in Western Australia. It's not made of water, but stone. It can be up to 50 feet tall and almost 300 feet long. It's especially incredible after rains in winter, when the Western Australian wildflowers fill up the entire landscape. In Atlanta, there's a world of Coca-Cola museum. The formula for the secret recipe is in a large security vault, heavily guarded at all times. Only a handful of people can get through those vault doors. Since its creation in 1886, the company has kept it a secret for only the most honest employees. In 2006, a former worker tried to sell the formula to Pepsi, only for Pepsi to call the police and inform Coca-Cola. The polka dot legs is a must for anyone who is in British Columbia. After the summer's scorching heat evaporates the lake's water, it leaves behind yellow, blue, and green water spots. These pools are full of all sorts of minerals, like sodium, calcium, and magnesium sulfates, that get concentrated in the pools. You can't get too close or even dip your feet into them. A fence protects the entire lake with a sign about how culturally and ecologically sensitive the area is. In Death Valley, California, there's a mystery of the sailing stones. Since the early 1900s, the mystery of how all these stones were seemingly moving by themselves across the desert floor baffled everyone. Some believe that the rocks move by thin pieces of ice around the stones pushed by winds after winter. No one ever saw any of these rocks moving until 2014. Scientists set time-lapse recorders, and the footage showed the rocks sliding along the ground over time. The marble caves in Chile, located in the beautiful area of Patagonia, formed from over 6,000 years of waves wearing down the rocks. The crystal blue walls reflect the vibrant turquoise water, making it perfect for kayaking. Walking in Chestnut Ridge Park in New York, one can see an eternal flame. What makes this one stand out, though, is it's underneath a waterfall. Occasionally, the flame will go out for short periods, but it will light up again. Sometimes it's thanks to certain hikers along the way. If you ever stop your car on a magnetic hill in New Brunswick, Canada, you'll see the car might start rolling backwards up the hill all by itself. While it looks like it's moving the wrong way, this is just an illusion. There are several hills like this all around the world. What looks like an incline is the opposite, all because there's no horizon for perspective. The brightest bioluminescent bay in the world, called Puerto Mosquito, is located off the coast of Puerto Rico. The bay is named for the pirate Roberto Cofrisi and his small boat, El Mosquito, not after those annoying insects. During the summer months, you'll have glassy water at night with millions of tiny microorganisms bumping into each other and emitting blue light. The Chocolate Hills in the Philippines is a group of unusually shaped hills located in the middle of the island of Bohol in the Philippines. There are 1,000 to 2,000 discovered so far. They have nothing to do with chocolate at all, but they resemble the color after the dry season, when the grass turns from green to brown. In the northeastern part of Thailand, 466 miles away from Bangkok, is a 75-million-year-old rock formation sticking right out of the mountains. Their shapes look just like a pod of whales swimming together. No wonder this place is called Three Whale Rocks. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert, but this land has changed quite dramatically during this time. These sandstone mountains were lifted up by plate tectonics, that's the shifting of the crust layers, called lithosphere, and erosion by the Mekong River, resulting in the strangely shaped rock formations we see today. Salar de Uni in Bolivia is the world's largest salt flat. At 4,050 square miles in size, it's twice as large as Grand Canyon National Park. After winter has passed, the Salt Lake is transformed into a beautiful giant sky-reflecting mirror between September and May. With salt all the way to the horizon, it creates an illusion of endlessness. The thin layer of water left over from ice melting creates a shimmering effect of the sky, making it one of the best places to visit in the world. The Catambo River in Venezuela might be the stormiest place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days a year. The lightning storms are so consistent, and they're predicted three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. 
When the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, the static charges cause a lightning storm that happens nearly every night. Off the southern tip of Japan lies the Yanaguni Formation. Archaeologists believe that the monument belongs to a fabled Pacific civilization, like Atlantis, that vanished beneath the waves thousands of years ago. If it's truly a lost civilization, or just nature having a little fun, this is the site to dive into. Features inside the structure resemble stonework, like castles, temples, and a stadium, connected by roads and what seems to be large walls all the way around. There are even marks in the stone that appear to show quarry work, faded faces, and rocks sculpted into animal shapes. Some scientists believe that the symmetry of the stones is not as straight as reported. It appears solid rock, rather than carved blocks, weathered down by all the water over many years. Plitvice Lakes National Park in Croatia is an interconnected chain of waterfalls, the tallest being 230 feet, and underground water channels, creating natural dams and lakes in such a picturesque environment. Found in the deep woodlands surrounded by meadows brimming with wildflowers, brown bears, gray wolves, lynx, deer, and plenty of rare bird species for bird watchers call these 115 square miles of the National Park home. You're strapped in a boat cruising down the Amazon River with the sun scorching hot. As you check out your map, your boat starts rocking back and forth. The water is starting to get more intense, so you hang on for dear life. You tuck your map in your pocket and try to take control of your boat. You strike some jagged rocks and duck low to avoid tree branches. Your boat strikes a large rock out of nowhere and capsizes. You're swimming in the murky green water. While you're trying your best to get ashore, your boat gets washed away. Underneath the water lies a whole new world of bizarre and dangerous animals. Kandiru fish are snake-like creatures that can grow up to 16 inches long. Arapimus can weigh more than an adult male and are taller than most basketball players. They're the biggest freshwater fish in South America. They have a hybrid gill system that forces them to pop up to the surface every 5 to 15 minutes to breathe in oxygen for their large swim bladder. You swim out of the raging water and dry yourself off. Oh no, your map is completely soaked. There's no way you can get to your destination without it. You venture into the thick rainforest, shoving the branches and leaves away. As you get deeper, you notice something on a tree. It's barely moving, but it's got sharp claws and a raggedy coat. It stretches its arm to another branch and tries to pull itself up. Ever so slowly. Sloths sleep more than half their days and only head down from trees once a week. They're so motionless, they sometimes grow algae and moss on their fur. The rainforest gets denser with each step until there's barely any sunlight illuminating the path in front of you. You notice a figure following you. With every branch you step on, you can hear a faint sound right next to you creeping around. You start walking a bit faster and the sound catches up with you. You make it out of the dense part and tread along a narrow path until you reach a cliff. You can't walk normally here, so you pin against the wall and walk sideways to cross the hills. You slowly move across with the river 30 feet below you. You move your right foot, and some rocks fall into the river. You keep going and misstep. You're about to fall, but you hold on to a large tree branch and pull yourself up. You notice a couple of colorful poison frogs inches away from your fingers. Touching any of these frogs can be extremely dangerous and harmful, despite their amazing color patterns. The golden poison frog is one of the most poisonous animals in the world. One of them hops right next to you, so you let go of the branch and fall back in the river. The river is washing you down until you reach a calm current. Underneath you is a swarm of piranhas swimming with their sharp teeth. The red color on their skin is unmistakable, so you swim off like an Olympic athlete. Piranhas will eat anything that gets in their way, no matter the size. You grip onto a log and climb up a small rock to catch your breath. There's a huge electric eel underneath the rock. Despite their name, they're more related to catfish than eels. They use their powerful 600 volts of electricity to defend themselves and catch food. You're stuck, unless you're like the common basilisk that can run on the water like a jet ski. These incredible lizards have special webbing on their toes. 
and can run the distance of a basketball court. You hop on a bunch of rocks until you reach the land. You continue walking along the riverbank until you come across a moving rock. You rub your eyes and see it moving again. It's a dinosaur-looking turtle that resembles a crocodile with armor. The Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle that disguises itself with its surroundings to catch prey. Their heads stretch longer than their bodies. You shimmy your way past it and continue. You head back into the rainforest and find a spot to rest. Wait, there are giant ants everywhere! They're the biggest ants in the world and can produce one of the most painful stings out there, even comparable to a wasp's sting. You immediately get up and find another place to rest. As you continue walking along, you notice the same feeling of something following you. You can hear some leaves rustling, but it's getting dark and there's no way of telling. You find a nice little spot to build a campfire and catch some Zs, but in the Amazon, everything is a threat except for those cute capybaras wandering around. They live in groups next to water sources. They're also the biggest rodents in the world. You don't need to worry about them if you're stuck in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Suddenly, you feel something slithering up next to you. You look down and see a massive green anaconda just about to constrict you. They are the heaviest snakes in the world and can grow up to 20 feet long and have a huge appetite. You get up and sprint your way out of there. All right, you found a decent cave to crash in. It's daytime again, and you're still alive. You continue walking along the rainforest. You were able to find some breakfast to boost your energy for the rest of the day. You spot something on a tree that looks like a branch, but it's actually a potu, a master of disguise that can spend days motionless on broken tree branches. These bizarre birds use those branches as their permanent home, where they lay their eggs and chill all day. You continue your way through the rainforest and see a Brazilian wandering spider crawling on a tree branch right in front of you. Eight of these species can be found in the Amazon area. They are some of the most aggressive and venomous spiders out there. So you make a big detour and walk away from it. You feel someone walking next to you again, but you still can't figure out what it is. You see a steep cliff with a waterfall hitting a large lake ahead of you. Looks peaceful, until you see a team of black caimans gathering around the shore. They're the biggest predators in the whole Amazon ecosystem and feed on anything that moves. It's a good thing you're on high ground, otherwise, whoa! You slip and fall down the river, right on the deep end. So far, no caimans spotted you. You swim underwater and try to get to the opposite end of where the reptiles are. As you climb out and dry yourself off, you notice some large black spots on you. You try pulling them off, but they've latched on pretty hard. The Amazon giant leech finds its target by tracking movement and shadow. Once they attach themselves to the skin, it's extremely difficult to extract them. The best way to do so is to slide your finger next to its mouth and pull it off slowly. (laughs) You manage to get them off your body and see that the caimans are swimming towards you. You're pinned to the wall with the lake of hungry reptiles approaching. Suddenly, a pink dolphin jumps out of the water and splashes all over them. They can grow larger than humans and are the celebrities of the Amazon. Scientists think they get their color from the blood capillaries on their skin. The Amazon even has bull sharks swimming around. These carnivorous giant fish are threatening to humans and can swim in both salt water and fresh water. These sharks prey on anything within their reach, including other sharks. The dolphin distracted the caimans, so you climb up the cliff and try to find the best way to escape. Opened jaws waiting for you to fall into the pit are right below you. You're lucky enough to escape to the top, but as your arms pull you up, the first thing that you see is a jaguar looking straight at you. It's the creature that's been following you this whole time. You get up while it starts circling you, timing its strike. You know that you can't take on a jaguar, nor can you outrun it, so you grab a large tree branch from the ground to defend yourself. It jumps at you, but you duck down in time. The jaguar lands in the water far away from the caiman crocs. It's a good thing these large kitties are excellent swimmers. You pick yourself up and continue. And to your surprise, you find your boat again. You fix it up and sail your way out of the Amazon. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? 
Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number six. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> A lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean. And it's salty. Like, a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup. You'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. 
They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred-foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates, to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water, and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. Let's test to see how many spiral-shaped objects you can find around you right now. I'll bet there's more than you think. A spiral may be hidden in the flower petals of your houseplants. One might be staring at you from that seashell you brought home from your last trip to the beach. If none of these objects sound familiar, you might want to head over to the mirror and turn to the side a bit. In case you haven't noticed yet, even our own ears are shaped like a spiral. Why does Mother Nature seem to have such a preference for this shape? Many theories wish to explain this weird behavior. One of them is based on the Fibonacci sequence. 
this Italian mathematician didn't really care much for spirals initially. He was studying rabbits when he came up with this theory. Fibonacci came up with the sequence as a solution to a problem involving the growth of a population of rabbits. Let's recreate his experiment. If you put a pair of rabbits in an enclosed space, how many pairs of rabbits will you find there after a year? To solve this problem, Fibonacci proposed some conditions for his theoretical experiment. That all rabbits are born as a pair, one male, one female. Also, the rabbits can start reproducing after one month. More so, each pair of rabbits produces one pair of offspring each month. And lastly, none of the rabbits kicks the bucket at the end of the year. Now, Using these assumptions, Fibonacci noticed the following sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on. The first two numbers in the sequence, 1, 1, represent the initial pair of rabbits. The next number, 2, represents the number of pairs of rabbits after the first month. One pair of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. The fourth number, 3, represents the number of pairs after the second month. Two pairs of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. And so on. He soon noticed that his series is made out of numbers in which each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. A lot of other mathematicians have looked at this sequence over the years. They were soon surprised to discover that this system was found in many natural structures, such as the arrangement of leaves on a stem and the arrangements of seeds on a sunflower. If you don't understand why it is so, then grab a piece of paper and a pen. Together, let's try to draw the Fibonacci spiral. You'll have to start with a small circle at the center of your page and then draw larger circles around it without lifting the pen from the paper, using the numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. For example, the first circle is 0 units wide, the second circle is 1 unit wide, the third circle is 1 unit wide, and so on. As you keep adding more circles, they will fit together perfectly to form a spiral shape. The spiral gets bigger and bigger, but it always follows the same pattern based on the Fibonacci sequence. Another famous spiralist was a man named James Bell Pettigrew. He was a Scottish naturalist that became fascinated by the mystery of the spiral shape, which he noticed almost everywhere in nature. He studied it at all scales, from giant nebulae in space to tiny molecules. Despite his research, he couldn't figure out where the spiral came from. He was sure that it couldn't be just a physical thing, and he believed that organs and plants and animals are not only shaped like spirals, but they also work in a spiral way. At the center of lifetime work on this unique shape was the human heart. Pettigrew believed that the heart's spiral structure was the mystery of all mysteries. He also thought this shape was to blame for both its muscular contractions and how the blood seemed to travel within our mighty tickers. The reason why the spiral seems to be everywhere might be really simple. Efficiency. Take a look at the basic sunflower, for example. It figured out a way to display its seeds so that it could expose them to the sun equally, without wasting any space and without being limited in their growth. Spiral stairs are another great example, too. They just work better. You find it easier to climb them, and they should take less space than the usual ones. We also might be more inclined to notice this shape more than others. That's because a spiral shape, or its proportions, is more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. It's the reason why interior designers, artists, or illustrators often use these principles in their work. The spiral symbol is also the oldest symbol found in every civilized continent. Some historians believe that the spiral in Asian art may represent the sun as it has been found on roof tiles from the Tang Dynasty near the ancient city of Chang'an. It is also often found at burial sites, and scientists believe it to represent the circle of life, how we pass on and somehow be reborn. This is probably because in some ancient civilizations, people believed that the sun was born each day, extinguished itself each night, and was reborn the next day. You might have also stumbled upon the spiral as a symbol of hypnosis and dizziness. There's no real evidence that you can hypnotize someone by making them stare into a spiral for a certain time. 
but its effects on our abilities to focus and our optic nerves are significant. After you've stared at a spinning spiral for quite some time, you'll notice how objects either get smaller or bigger, depending on the direction of the spiral. It's easy to understand why some experience this sensation as hypnotizing. One of the most distinctive features of DNA is its spiral shape. It's also called a double helix. The double helix is formed when two strands of DNA twist around each other, like a ladder being twisted into a spiral shape. This spiral shape is important for many reasons. First, the spiral shape allows DNA to be compact and efficient. The double helix can pack a lot of genetic information into a small space, making it possible for cells to store vast amounts of genetic material in a small area. Second, the spiral shape allows DNA to be flexible and respond to changes in our environment. Because the double helix is made up of two strands that can move relative to each other, our DNA can change its shape. Finally, the spiral shape of DNA allows it to interact with other molecules in the cell. Now, let's look at the big picture. I mean, the biggest of them all, that of the galaxies found in our universe. They're also shaped like a spiral due to their rotation and the presence of dark matter. As the galaxy spins, the stars and gas clouds within the galaxy move in a circular direction around its center. This movement creates a spiral shape as the stars and gas clouds are drawn toward the center of the whole system. Additionally, the presence of dark matter, which is a type of matter that does not interact with light, creates gravitational forces that help to shape the galaxy into a spiral. But you don't need to look that far to understand why spirals are important. Your handy corkscrew is shaped like a spiral too, because it makes it easier for you to open the wine bottle. That screw you drilled into the wall to hang a picture? Also a spiral. It helps it with some added grip and stability. Got a notebook on your desk? Those pages might be held together by a spiraled wire. It makes it easier for you to browse the notebook without damaging the pages. Even your hair strands might have a curled shape. The curlier the hair, the drier it will be. It means it will get sebum from the scalp down on the strand slower, making it easier to maintain and clean. And before I spiral out of control, (laughs) we're done here. Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice. The rings of Saturn. They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, Some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D ring. It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So, people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. 
At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the Sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then, people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better, but then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit, because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. Now think about building a base on a space object. But your best friend lands on another one a few miles away. Then a giant icicle crashes into his rock and increases its speed. And a few days later, your friend is too far away. And it happens all the time. The only way to change your life is to settle on one of Saturn's moons. The planet has 83 of them. People have already confirmed and named 63, and the existence of 20 others has yet to be confirmed. They're all like different worlds. Some of them may be habitable, and the best candidate among them is Titan. There may be water on it, and its atmospheric pressure is only one and a half times greater than Earth's. Its atmosphere consists of nitrogen and a little methane, forming carbon smog in Titan's upper layers. For this reason, we can't study this moon from Earth. But the coolest thing is that Titan flies outside the rings of Saturn. This means people can lead a quiet life there. There's also satellite Phoebe, covered with craters like our moon. This giant celestial body looks more like a gigantic meteorite. People have a lot of choices of where to start a new life. During a couple of hundred years spent on ships near Saturn, humanity would learn everything about its satellites. But why did they try to live on the rings? Why didn't they land on one of the moons from the very beginning? Because, well, then this video would be less fun and a whole lot shorter.
But what if we were initially born inside the rings of Saturn? Let's say a massive meteorite with frozen water got caught by the planet's gravity. There were the simplest life forms inside the ice. And then, this life began to acquire more developed forms. Imagine that the large rock managed to remain untouched for hundreds of millions of years. And during this time, humans appeared. But of course, they would be very different there. Firstly, they wouldn't experience gravitational forces. This would make them taller, but weaker. People's skin would be pale because of the lack of light, but very hardy thanks to cold temperatures. Particles of ice and grains of sand flying in space would roughen people's skin. In such biological armor, without gravity, they would jump from one rock to another in search of food and water. And by the way, that would be the main problem. How would people survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space? Where would they get their food? Saturn's rings are a pretty lifeless and dangerous place. If there are not even the simplest forms of life there, then how could such a complex one as the human appear? Therefore, even in theory, 